here. Uh, obviously, a little bit different feel this morning as we're together for class in here, which changes my whole morning schedule every time we do this. So I'm a little frantic, making sure everything's done. But we are really glad to have Scott Sager with us. Scott, of course, has been a friend to this church for the last couple of years, helped us out so much um, in our interim time between preachers not too long ago. Scott serves as a vice president of church relations at Lipscomb University in Nashville. Uh, he also is now working with the Granny White Church of Christ right there by the campus and um, does seminars, teaches, preaches, uh, teaches at the school, Bible at the school, and so he's a busy, busy guy. He is also really in the know, if you will, and that's why I'm really excited about this class. I think emerging adults is uh, something that we really need to be concerned about where they are in their walk and um, how do we minister to and with them. And so I'm really looking forward to that class, and I need to let him talk, so I'll shut up. Scott, thanks for being here, and take it away. Well, it's great to be back in Huntsville, and am I super loud? When did, yeah, okay. Okay, somewhere in between. There we go. Well, it's great to be back in Huntsville. I'm honored to be here, and uh, what a delight uh, to be back at Twickenham. So uh, let's pray as we ask God's blessing over our time together. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We pause to give you praise this morning, and we thank you for another day. For some of us who are early risers, this is uh, uh, the day that we just get extra time, and for others, it's like uh, a breath of fresh air to get a little more sleep, and we're where, wherever we fall on that spectrum, we're grateful. And this morning, we join the psalmist in saying, um, just how wonderful it is and how happy we are when uh, someone said, hey, let us go up to the house of the Lord and worship. And so we're grateful to be here and for each other and for this church and for your claim upon our lives and for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, through whom we pray. Amen. Hopefully you have a handout that goes with uh, uh, the message here. And what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about Reaching emerging adults, and emerging adults is a way of talking about millennials, it's a way of talking about those uh, that are in this youngest moving into adulthood stage. And so this handout will give you a few things that we're learning about them, but as we start, I just wanted you to know that everywhere I go and everywhere I travel, one of the things that remains constant in the churches that I go to visit is this. Look at this slide, <clears throat> and that is... Every church I talk to says, we're losing our young people. They're not here. We're missing them. They're not connected. They're not finding a home here. And so you can see the decline in worship attendance. That uh, kids from Christian homes are not scoring well on Bible-based tests. And uh, millennials uh, are less religious. They're becoming more, quote, fake. And um, also... They're more into being spiritual than they are into being religious. So a lot of people talk about the spiritual heart of a young person, but they'll also say that there's a challenge to see that play out. And one of the fastest growing uh, demographics, or the fastest one among millennials, is actually those who check the box, none, when they're asked about their religious commitments or religious affiliation. And that none is not N-U-N as in Catholic. It is the uh, N-O-N-E saying we have no religious affiliation. What's interesting is, you know, at Lipscomb, we're a Division I school, so we uh, recruit athletes. And we have about 220 athletes on campus every year. And generally speaking, about somewhere around 50 to 70 of those athletes will check the box none when they come onto our campus. And so they, it's a great place to start with them because they go on mission trips with our athletic programs. And we always smile at how many of our athletes are who gets converted on our mission trips because it's the first time that they've really engaged in a mission for God. It's the first time that they've been out and something like that. And so it, it happens, but none is where they are today. <clears throat> which we can look at as a crisis, we can look at as an opportunity. But that's where we find ourselves. Next slide. And so, <clears throat> even in the churches of Christ, what we're discovering is that we're losing our young people. 
Sometimes we're losing them to Bible churches or the latest kind of church in town. Often, though, we're just losing them all together. And I can tell you uh, at Lipscomb, as wonderful a school as it is, uh, about 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, there's not a lot of movement across the campus. You know, if it's the idea of getting up on Sunday morning and going to church is how we mark spirituality, once they get away from home, the rhythms change. And so that's what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today. And I wanted us to realize that this is not new, that we're not experiencing something that we can't go to the Word of God and find a a paradigm for, a time when this has happened before. And so I wanted us to think back to the exile for just a minute to the exile. And I wanted us to think back to uh, that time when Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem, 587 B.C. If you take my Bible class, you'll have to know that, okay? 587 B.C., and he sacked the city, and he destroyed the temple, and he carried away the gold. That's where Jeremiah sat on a hill and said, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. But part of what happened then is that Nebuchadnezzar decided that the wise strategy he should take to assimilate the Jews into the Babylonian culture was to pull out the best and the brightest and to bring them back to Babylon and educate them and give them uh, Babylonian names and study in Babylonian schools and be immersed in Babylonian culture and literature and astrology and astronomy and zoology, zoastry, and if they do all that, they'll forget and they'll become one of us. And so I want us to realize that we live in a time that's rapidly becoming post-Christian. If you live in other areas of the country outside of Huntsville or Nashville or whatever, you could say it already has become post-Christian. But most of us realize that things that were sacred spaces when we were growing up are not sacred spaces anymore. Things that you could kind of count on as the rhythms of the week and the way people would respond are not the way that it happens anymore. And so I wanted us to think through some people who have gone through this before us. Next slide. I think, here's your quiz question, okay? Remember, I'm a Bible teacher, so... uh, There was a young man, this is pre-exile, this was the first time this happened, who shows great capacity in a foreign land uh, to honor God regardless of circumstances. He saves his family from a famine, and you've got four possible answers here. FDR, Ronald Reagan, Winston Churchill, or what's the answer? Yeah, when I go on the road, I always like to make sure that everybody feels good. Yeah, my tests are harder uh, at school than this. So here's another one for you. Yeah. A courageous Jewish woman shows the faith and wisdom to outflank her enemies. She gains honor for her family. Who is it? Madonna, Judy Garland, Taylor Swift, Esther. There you go. Okay. But what I want to remind you of for just a minute, next slide, is Daniel. If you turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, you'll remember that Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, are seen as some of the best and the brightest of Israel. And they're taken into the king's custody. And they're going to be raised in the king's manor. They're given Babylonian names, Babylonian food, Babylonian education, Babylonian clothes, Babylonian mentors. And the thinking is we can get these boys to assimilate. Next slide. No, uh, back up. I'm sorry. We can leave anywhere in here. You're, you're doing great. <clears throat> Daniel 1, 1 and 2. <clears throat> but it says that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's food. And it says there was something different about Daniel. Something different about the way he had been raised, what was instilled in him, so that he could stand against the assimilating influences that were 
coming at him from every direction. And what I think we need to know about Daniel and about his three friends is that they were the exception and not the rule. The rule was assimilate into the culture. Go the way the culture is going, rationalize that that's what you ought to do, and end up in a different place with a different identity, with a different way of understanding, a different worldview. And that's the challenge that's going on all over our campuses. Christian campuses, state schools, wherever students are, their worldview is being bombarded. They're being called to assimilate into a world that doesn't believe in truth, that thinks that everything is relative, that moral absolutes are a thing of the past. And the question is, how do you raise young people that can stand up in that culture? What, what do they need? Next slide. You see, the three questions that I'm asking right now as a father of a high school senior are these three questions. You're thinking, I'm thinking, where is she going to go to school? And I am wondering about how much scholarship money can we get? Some of those kind of things. But the real questions I have about my daughter as she approaches graduation is, can she balance the human teaching with the wisdom that comes from God's Word? When she goes off to college, is she still going to read her Bible? When she goes off to college, number two, is she going to maintain a life of prayer and devotion in a hostile environment? Have we equipped her to take the time to pray and to hear from God every day? And can she say no to influences that are going to be calling her to be something other than what she is? And is she ready to stand up to that? <clears throat> and we just need to understand that that is the challenge that Christian kids are having regardless of where they choose to go to college. Now, it's much greater if you go to a state school. But I don't want to pretend like, regardless of where you go, that there's not an opportunity to assimilate, to lose your way. And so, <clears throat> I wanted us to see that the world of the exile is a lot like our world. There's no overarching narrative that everybody lives in. There's no right or wrong. There's no sacred space. There's no one way of looking at really any issue. And so how do we raise kids like Daniel that make a decision not to defile themselves and that are willing to stand alone even against a culture that's pushing really hard? And so what we've discovered to kind of help us think through this is we do a survey, next slide, at Lipscomb every year of about 3,000 students and we ask them a series of questions that helps us to kind of plot Who's coming to see us? Now remember, this is who they are when you send them off. And this is what we're learning about them. And you're thinking, how do you get 3,000 people to take a survey? And the answer is, we bribe them with chapel credit. And uh, so they can take the survey and they can get chapel credit for us. So we get a great pool of responses for this. But I wanted you to see eight things, and I believe this is where your handout picks up eight things that we're learning about emerging adults. And I'm going to run through these uh, pretty quickly. I need to be done by, in, it looks like I got 24 minutes from now. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to make sure I stay on schedule. And when I'm five minutes from, can you like... Okay, got it, okay. <clears throat> the length of young adulthood, emerging adulthood, is lengthening. It's lengthening. Young people are maturing differently. In many ways, they're maturing faster because they have access to more knowledge, access to more than any generation has ever had. But here's the thing you need to understand about young people. You can think one moment you're talking to an adult, and the next moment you'll discover, no, I'm not. And I don't mean that with any disrespect toward them. 
what we learn is that the brain is not fully formed until you're 25 years old. And the decision-making part of our brain is still maturing all through our college years. And so they're maturing differently, but adolescence, this stage between being a kid and being adult, is lengthening. It's lengthening. <clears throat> now, I'm going to depress you by telling you how long they're saying adolescence goes. Adolescence starts at about 13. And they're saying now that it goes to somewhere between 27 and 29. That's the age when people begin to think of themselves as an adult. What does that mean? When they graduate from college, they don't think it odd to come home. <laughs> they don't think it's odd to sit on the couch and play video games at 24 years old. Because they still see themselves in adolescence. They're delaying family commitments, and they want to experience everything. Why would I settle down and get a job? I haven't seen Europe. <clears throat> I haven't been a ski instructor. And so they've got all these things that they want to do, and they think you can do them all. Now, that's not the way that Jesus was raised. Just so you'll know. <clears throat> you know why Jesus went to the temple when he was 12? Bar mitzvah. Because there was a ceremony in Nazareth where Joseph went into the synagogue and he brought his young son Jesus with him and Jesus stood before the congregation and he read from the scriptures in Hebrew and his father announced that he was now a young man and the rest of the community announced you are now a young man you're part of us. You don't sit in the back anymore. You sit here with the men. You study with the men. You come to synagogue and you learn with the men. And bat mitzvah is the same process that was being done for the young women. And if you go to Israel today, you'll discover that it's still happening that way. When kids turn 13, you're now a young adult. We're going to put more responsibility on you. We're going to call for more from you. When you turn 18, great. You can go to college, but you've got two years of military service if you're female and three if you're male. And it's teaching young people to grow up. And one of the things that the church has to offer to this generation is to help them to grow up and to tell them that you're a man, and to tell them that we'll mentor you into manhood, we'll mentor you into young womanhood. But we have to be the people that say, you know what, being a kid until you're 27 isn't the way God created you. Now women discover this a little bit more quickly than the men do, and I can tell you it's because you, you have biological clocks that tell you that you have become a young woman. And so you get it a little bit more than the guys do. And so especially men's ministry and this call into adulthood is really important. I won't take this long on the rest of them until we get to the last two. But let's uh, move through a few more of these. The desire to change the world and have a cause is great. They identify with causes. Have you seen kids that got like 14 armbands on of different things that they care about? But sometimes uh, cause overload can happen. They know so much more about what's happening in the world than we did. You know, one of the blessings of not having national news that was on every moment and the internet announcing every earthquake is that we didn't really live into a world that there was so much wrong. We just didn't know. 
And they do know. And so causes and getting concerned and changing the world is really important to this generation. They want to change the world, but they have no idea how kingdom of God and changing the world fit together. And so changing the world becomes a compelling narrative. Things like Tom's and other programs that are set up to do something good, something that they want to be a part of. Uh, number three, service is their doctrine, but connecting it to Jesus is a challenge. They're into service. They're into doing things. Now, they're often into doing what's the new service, the new thing. Uh, the woman runs salt for us, which is service and learning together at Lipscomb. And it's this idea that you, uh, in the midst of your classes, you do service that helps to bring you a greater education in the area of life that you want to enter into, service and learning together. She says the real challenge is to get people to commit to a cause and stick with it. That they'll do this one, and then they want to do that one, and then they want to do this one and that one. But service... Uh, is their doctrine. And they do it for lots of different reasons. Therapeutic, it feels good. They like making a difference. Uh, it looks good on a resume. And uh, the one I tell them all the time in my freshman Bible class, I say, you should go on a mission trip. It's a great place to meet a wife. And they go like, what? And I said, well, think about it. You'll get to see her 24 hours a day without makeup She'll be hot, she'll be tired, she'll be sweaty, she'll be hungry. You'll really get to know her on this mission trip. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's a great way, service is a great way to meet people and to make friends. But how do you connect it to your faith? That becomes a real question. Number four, loyalty to friends in a cause takes precedence even over personal truth. Let me put this one simply. For most of us, older adults, we view emerging adults as too soft, too flimsy. They'll give up on what they believe at the drop of a hat. And they look at us and they ask the question, why would you sacrifice a friendship over a truth? We would ask, why would you sacrifice a truth for a friendship? And they would ask, why would you sacrifice a friendship for a truth? Tolerance is the dominant narrative of the day. I'm right, but you're not wrong. And the whole idea that we're going to fight about issues, they would rather flee than fight. They just don't like it. Uh, an example of that, something I learned about, we had a few years ago a group called Soul Force that came to Lipscomb. It's an LGBT group, and uh, 18 students got on a rainbow-colored bus up in the Northeast, and they began a journey for the whole semester going across the campus at selected universities that had uh, faith statements, hiring policies, student handbooks, that they felt were anti-LGBT standards. And they sent us a letter saying, hey, we're going to come and protest at Lipscomb. And uh, because they do this every year, we were able to talk to some other schools, including Samford uh, here in Alabama, and find out, how did you handle this? And we learned that some schools would chain the gates shut and not let them on campus. And uh, that's what a school in Georgia did right before they came to visit us. But we felt like that's giving them exactly what they want because what they want is press. Press that they can turn into contributions. So we said, great, come and we'll feed you lunch on a Sunday night. We'll give you a tour of the campus. We'll have a student escort for each one of you for the time that you're here. And so they got off the bus and there were 18 student escorts who had been trained and had gone through some classes uh, during chapel uh, to prepare them to be the hosts. They met them, they had a gift bag, had a t-shirt, this kind of stuff, gave them a tour of the campus. We ate dinner together, then the students left and just the senior administration of the school, we sat down with them and said, okay, what do you want to talk about? And uh, 
we told them that we could build some bridges, but we also had some very firm convictions that are different than yours. But what was interesting, when this was happening, and they stayed on Monday, and we did some seminars and talked through some stuff, but what our students were most concerned about was that there were going to be students in our student body that were going to be hurt by this process. Because when you start talking about truth, when you start talking about moral absolutes, the potential for somebody to get hurt is great. And that's what their best, biggest fear was. And so that's where I think it's important for us to hear that it, if you are mean, you lose your voice. They can't hear you if you're mean. Paul said what? Speaking the truth in will grow into all things. And sometimes it takes so much boldness on our part to speak the truth, you know, to summon up the courage to say what needs to be said, that doing it with love is not what comes over. Uh, there's a guy, Larry King, you remember when he had a television show? And uh, he would often invite four ministers to come and talk about an issue or three ministers and a rabbi. And um, I would sometimes watch that. And there was one man that I always agreed with more than others. It's my dad's favorite preacher. You'd like to think I was his favorite preacher, but John MacArthur is his favorite preacher. And uh, John MacArthur would often be one of them. And he always said things that I totally resonated with, but if I ever turned the sound down and I just looked at the screen, he was the most mean-looking of the people that were up there. And I think we have got to figure out how to speak truth with love. Like we don't have to win. Like we just have to say what God called us to say. But we say it in love. And, uh, and so that became an important thing that we learned from this. Don't be afraid to speak the truth, but make sure that you speak the truth in love. There was a Scottish minister one time who gave up his uh, parish, still lived in the village, and the young minister who had taken his place was walking through town on a Sunday afternoon, and he said, Hi, laddie, what did you preach on today? And the young minister said, I preached on hell. And the old minister said, Ah, but did ye do it with a tear in your eye? And that's the wisdom of understanding how to deal with this, is you speak the truth in love. Next one. Emerging adults are broadly connected, yet often feel confused. <clears throat> Emerging adults sometimes think we're stupid. They think that they can sit at the dinner table And we don't know that they've got a cell phone underneath, right? Yeah. Well, what is it that makes somebody do this? What, what is it that makes us do this? What makes you check your email over and over again? Or think you have to stop whoever you're talking to to respond to a text message? We've got this whole feel like technology is helping us. And you know what it's doing in many, many, many ways? It's dividing us. Students come into my class, and they're so busy texting people who aren't in the class that they never get to know the names of the people sitting next to them. And before we think too much of that, how many of us know the names of our neighbors that we've lived next to for years? We've become people who have more and more connections but are less connected. And there's a theory behind this. It's called ambiguity theory. And ambiguity theory says that in order for a relationship to really grow, you have to be both physically and psychologically present. So when a soldier is here and their spouse is over in Afghanistan and they're Skyping back and forth every day, that's better than nothing, right? But it's not the same as sitting down and being together. 
And our young people have so many virtual friendships, virtual relationships, that what they really need are just the real ones where you sit down with somebody and you really get to know them. And so that's what we're seeing. Uh, Personal skills is a challenge sometimes too. They convey an image yet want to be real and authentic at the same time. Does that make sense? In other words, they'll craft their Instagram, their Facebook page, the many things that kind of tell people who they are. They'll spend a lot of time crafting those. But at the same time, they want adults who are just real and authentic, who are just who they are. And one of the greatest values that they see in adults are those who are authentic enough to admit that they make mistakes, to admit that they're not perfect, to admit that they blew that. Uh, You gain credibility by admitting your mistakes. And uh, and so that one becomes important. The last two is where I want to spend uh, the last seven minutes that I have. Because this is one that will make uh, perfect sense to you, but uh, maybe you just hadn't thought about it in this way. But they're looking for a vibrant faith in a personal mosaic. Those of you who aren't into art, you know, a mosaic is where you take different colored tiles and you, it's like making a stained glass window, a mosaic. And the way that young people are approaching their faith is that it's personal, not communal. And that it's my responsibility and I get to piece that faith together however I want. So the idea of having a church home that you go to on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and small group is puzzling to them. Because they're thinking, well, why wouldn't I go over there for the music on Thursday and I'll come over here for the meal and I really like that guy so I'll go listen to him and so they piece together their own mosaic of what faith looks like and they'll pick and choose from a lot of different stuff because they want to experience more and they've got the freedom and the opportunity to do that So let me go check that out. Let me go see this. Let me hear that. And so their way of thinking about plugging into a local congregation is they're just thinking, I've got too many things I want to experience to to just do that. There are exceptions, but for a lot, that's what you see. We see that all the time in Nashville. Uh, Students can go to chapel. They take a Bible class. They can go to a Wednesday night on campus, or they can go to a Wednesday night at one of the churches that feeds them. And food is a big part of where do you go to church on Wednesday night. On Thursday night, there's an instrumental service off campus, and a lot of them like to go to that. It's called Sanctuary. It's led by students. It's for students. You know, they can choose uh, to go to church in the morning on Sunday, or they can choose to go to church in the evening on Sunday. They can choose to walk to the church where I am, or they can choose to go to a church with their friends. And who's in town? And where do you go? And what's happening at your place? And then there's also the Ethos Church, which is a wonderful church with a a minister who's a great preacher, a good friend of mine. But it's kind of got the cool vibe of it doesn't meet in a church building. It meets in a bar. And you take communion at the bar. Or it meets in a music marathon warehouse. But it's got this whole different feel to it. And they walk in and they're like, oh, this is kind of cool. I like the way this feels. This is different. And so they're at this point where they're experiencing a lot of different things. And that's just kind of the phase that they're in. And uh, in the conclusions in just a second, I'll tell you what my thought is on that. This was the biggest aha to me, number eight, the last one. Emerging adults are forming faith in a singleness context. Because they're delaying commitments, increasing the length of adolescence, they're making decisions that most of you made married single. 
you were at least serious about somebody when you decided where you were going to live after college. You had a mate in mind when you thought about where you were going to live or buy a house or do the things that you do. And they're doing these things from a singleness mindset. And so here's what that does for them. And I'm just going to be blunt. Is that all right, since we're in a hurry? Blunt, okay? They walk into churches like mine, the Granny White Church. They might walk... Isn't that a lousy name for a church, by the way? We're working really hard to change that, but it's, uh, it's been a sacred space for a long time. But, you know, I was presenting this stuff at, at our church uh, about a year and a half ago, and somebody at the end said, why do you think, you know, young people don't want to go to our church? And I said, well... You know, we're struggling with a lot of different things, but first of all, I mean, the name of our church isn't very good. Granny White. I mean, which part of that makes you think young people, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the fact that we have any African Americans coming to a church named Granny White is, uh, is a challenge, you know? And if we're not thinking through those things, we're not. I, I know a, ch a church back in Texas called the White, uh, White Settlement Church. You know? I mean, that's not very smart, is it? And so, uh, back to this. The other thing that we're learning about young people is that they walk into churches like ours. You know what they say? This is a church for married people. Everything rotates, revolves around being married. If you do research in Huntsville, you'll probably discover that half, over half, of the adult population in Huntsville is what? Single. But churches are constructed around being married. And you know what we say to young people? What they hear? Well, if you'll just get married and have a kid, then we can make you a deacon, and then you can do something. And they're like, I want to change the world now. I want to do something now. So what's happening in every city is that single generation churches are popping up. They don't want to wait, so they're starting their own cool churches. And they're appealing to young people. And so young people are leaving churches like ours and going to these single generation churches. And so one of the things that we have to do, this isn't in your notes, but in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus talked about those that are single. Some were born eunuchs, some had eunuch thrust upon them, and then he says these words, and some chose to be single for the sake of the kingdom of God. And I think the Mormons do a really good job of saying, while you're single, let us help you do something transformative dynamic, exciting. But instead of having them going off somewhere else and doing that, the argument is, no, let's be the place that unleashes them to do the things that they want to do and grow up in the process, right? And so here's some uh, final thoughts as we close. They're at the bottom of your uh, sheet. Oh, man, I forgot about this part. Real fast, okay, two minutes. <clears throat> okay, you're supposed to clap twice, okay? In the exile, there were three options available. They could assimilate, they could entrench, or they could decide to do things differently. Remember, there was a whole group of parents in the exile, and you know what they said? They said, we're losing our young people. What do we do? And so something amazing happened. You know how we're speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent, people? This, is, this blows up our, our model a little bit here. If you study the scriptures and you read through the Old Testament, what you will never find in anywhere in the Bible is God saying, thou shalt create synagogue. Read it. You won't find it. But you know what there wasn't before they went into exile and was central to their life after the exile? Synagogue. Synagogue was their response to saying, we're losing our young people and we've got to do things differently. And so synagogue became the place where they worshipped, 
Were they instructed and educated? Were they memorized scripture and recited it regularly? Were they reminded themselves of who they were as a people? And so the question for us is, what are we willing to do? How radical will we be to set things in place that help us to raise up a generation like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Esther, and the bunch? Fourth, uh, five takeaways as we close. Emerging adults are people. You don't win them as a block. You win them one by one by one by getting to know them. Connections recur, occur around relationship. Meet somebody for coffee. They love coffee. View your church as a way station, as a place where they can come and find connections and something that they need. You probably won't be able to be everything that they need, but think about how you can be something that they need. And think about doing it at a time that works best for them. Honest and authentic is very important, and let singleness be a whole number. Let singleness be a whole number. And say there's a place for single people here in the leadership, in the way that we structure ourselves, and the things that we do. We have great value that we place upon single people. Let me pray, and we'll join back together again when he starts singing. Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for the uh, opportunity to share this material and to think deeply about uh, how you can shape us to be the people who can raise up a generation that's mighty in spirit and active for you. We pray that you'll give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody.